I ever got in here? Uh, let's see here. In case you're wondering, that's a linearization on the board behind me for 17a. I was telling them how important it was to really understand linearizations because they would definitely be seeing that in 17c. And I know you guys know that that's true. Um, let's see what is going on in the world with you guys here. Okay, so there's, a, there's an, so some of you have an exam tomorrow. Is that correct? With for Carlson? Is that what my that's what my old information says that the Carlson people have a an exam on May fourteenth. Um, so. If that's you, good luck tomorrow. Um, I had kind of forgotten about Carlson. Carlson, as you know, has not been particularly communicative with me, so I don't really know what's going on in his class. Um, and I see that Rodemacher has an exam scheduled for next Friday. So hopefully everyone is, oh, Carlson moved the exam. Sorry, I didn't see how Julia had my chat covered up with something else. Okay, good to know. So that'll be, the 18th, whatever day of the week that is. Um, that'll be next Monday, all right. So I guess this Friday, maybe we should do some exam. I mean, we could even do it today, I guess, but I don't know, I don't know what we're gonna do today exactly. Um, brought my chicken here, thanks. Appreciate the chicken. Um, yeah, definitely Friday, we should do some exam prep. What I would um, ask of those of you, both in Carlson and Rodemacher's class, is if you have any practice exam materials to send them my way. I should be able to access the Rademacher stuff, like his, his canvas is accessible to me. So if it's on Canvas, I can find it from Rademacher. But specifically Carlson, if he has something for you guys, I would love to see it so that I can help you with it. Um, but yeah. So what do you guys want to talk about today? <laughs> We can continue talking about nonlinear differential equations, or we can start traveling down the road of probability and counting. Could we talk a little bit about the iso, client, ISO and null clines? Sure. And Same how thing. To, what's that? Same. Yeah. All right. So, sorry. Um, could we um, take a look at how to actually find them um, written uh, kind of without the p-plane, potentially? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you. Another topic that we can possibly go over is, um, I think today for Federico's, we went over, it was second order, second order, shoot, second order differential equations with one variable is what uh, we went over. Which, which I will fully admit, I'm not as familiar with. Um, okay. Yeah, I looked at, the textbook uh -huh. for 10.3. And I'm really confused how we're supposed to set up the problem. I get the gist that it's kind of similar to 10.2 where we have, where we create our own matrix of the system of equations. And then we just find the eigen, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And then we plug into the general solution part. I'm just not too sure how we set up for those, um, those problems with, um, real life applications, like in 10.3. Sure. So, so I will fully, so, so real life applications are never my strong suit, unfortunately. Like I'm just, I, especially when it comes to differential equations, I'm like differential equations are just not usually my cup of tea. Um, I know that they are often used to model fluid flow and things like that. Um, so that is certainly one possible example that a second order differential equation might be a model of. Um, so, and I see Jennifer asked about the FN model. Okay, I'm assuming, okay. So let me bounce around a little. So Teresa, you were saying that was in section 10.3? Yes, um, we have some problems in our homework where I think it's literally number two, number four, and number six mm -hmm. from the textbook. And I'm not too sure how to set 
set up those problems particularly. So like, you were just, we're talking about hemodialysis? Yeah. This textbook is just... Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, and I saw, I saw someone, I think on the discussion, post their, their solution or attempted solution to problem four. Like I think that was on there somewhere. And so one thing I'll say about these, the hard, what I imagine is one of the hard parts about these is there's no numbers, right? It's all just using letters as the constants, which I mean, shouldn't be harder, but it is harder, right? It just feels a little more challenging. So we can definitely look at a couple of those. Um, I don't see any of them being second order differential equations though, which I know you were asking about. Um, but we might have to, I know I saw that in his notes as well. Let's see, sorry, one sec. Sorry, it's hard to keep track of all the things. Let's see. Yeah, I see his notes from today. I definitely didn't see he was talking about second order differential equations. Okay, I'm gonna have to circle back around the second order later, but we'll look at that. Let's look at, um, so I think the order I'll do things is we'll look at problem two from the textbook in section 10.3. Then I'll kind of address this um, FN model, which I think is a homework question from Rodemacher. And then I'll talk more about the isoclines, which are the easy thing for you to think about. Okay. Oh, and I should give you guys the attendance one and stuff. All right, one sec. Um, might be a break. Okay, I will, then I'll, I'll, I'll punt a uh, second order until maybe Friday or next week after your guys' is midterm. Um, also, something I noticed, at least in the other class, let's see if it's true today. Yeah, finally. So for some reason, they started coming up as links now. Like, at least at least when I was typing them in before, the attendance and the tutoring, they were not showing as links, and you had to, like, copy and paste them. Is that true? Were you just able to click on them before? Oh, OK. Well, they weren't showing up that way for me. So I'm glad to see that they are now. So let's look at this terrible problem, too, from section 10.3. So hemodialysis is a process by which the machine is used to filter urea, or urea as you might say that word actually, and other waste products from the patient's blood if the kidneys fail. The amount within a patient during dialysis is sometimes modeled by supposing there are two compartments within the patient. The blood, which is directly filtered by the dialysis machine, and another compartment that cannot be directly filtered but that is connected to the blood. The system of two different equations describing this is B, C, D, T equal to negative K over B, C plus A, B times B, C. And then D, P, D, T equal to negative A, P plus B, C. Where C and P, so C is the concentration in the blood, and P is the concentration in the inaccessible pool. And all constants are positive. So A, B, K, and V are all positive. Um, well, they actually do give you some numbers you to work with. Okay, <laughs> so suppose that K over V equals one, a equals B equals one half. C of zero equals C naught. And P of zero equals C naught. That feels like it might be a typo. Okay. So classify the equilibria. All right. All right, so let's, let's replace some things here, right? So let's, so uh, this is a negative C plus one half A minus one half C. 
sorry, plus one out P. Negative, sorry, I shouldn't have erased that until I wrote it. Ah, sorry. Negative C, not negative one, negative one times C. And then we've got a plus one half P minus one half C. Yes, that's correct. And then here, this is one half, not one half. So Okay, come on, all right. Okay, so we can definitely talk about isoclines in this example as well, because there are, isoclines are always there. Right? They're always something we can talk about. So if to find the equilibrium, right, because for me, has to be at the to classify the equilibria, we are going to first find the equilibria. And you find the equilibrium by setting, so you can either imagine it as finding where these are both equal to zero, Equivalently, you can imagine it as finding where the isoclines intersect, which is literally the same thing. If you find the isoclines, I said it's equal to zero. Well, let's set them equal to zero. So this one seems easier to do. Here I'm going to get C equal to P, right? So I'll add this over here and then multiply both sides by two. Um, and so graphically, C equal to P, if I'm thinking, I'm, I always think of the first one as the X one and the second one as the Y one, but it's pretty standard. Um, you know. Yeah, I think it was the update three, so that's what I was supposing before. So here's X, which is my, or I guess C, right? It's my C axis, to my P axis. So C equals P just looks like this, and I guess I should just put that to the other one. And then um, here, let's see, we should put these together. So I've got one half P, oh, let's use a different color, just so I can differentiate my isoclines in right here. Got one half P equal to one half C plus C is three halves C, so P equals three C. God damn, I'm, I'm having a hard time writing this. Okay. So that's also a straight line through the origin. It's going to have a steeper slope, right? Because x is the c, so it's going to look like this. Okay. So those are two isoclines, and clearly the only equilibrium is at the origin. But we could also find that by taking our two equations and say, okay, I have to take this and jam this in here. So this is going to mean p equals 3p, and then 0 equals 2p, so p equals 0. Most of the time, it's a, yeah, most of the time it's a pretty good bet that 0, 0 is going to be one of your equilibria, and often your only equilibrium. OK. So then we want to classify this equilibrium, which involves looking at the eigenvalues of the matrix. So if I look at this, we'll see about this here. So if I rewrite this, I really got dc dt equal to negative 3 half c plus one half p and dp dt is equal to one half c minus one half p. You want to kind of be systematic, right? You want to write things in the same order. If c is the first differential equation, we write the c variable first and second thing. So my matrix is looking like negative three halves, one half, one half, negative one half. And I think we have a saddle. So how did I know that so fast? Well, I did the determinant of the matrix. Oh, I'm a liar. I don't think we have a saddle. I'm wrong. I did, I did the determinant wrong. So we should find the eigenvalues. Um, eigenvalues. So I'm going to do it the trace determinant way. My trace is negative 3 halves plus negative 1 half, which is negative 4 halves. So my determinant is the product here, which is 
3 fourths minus the product here, which is 1 fourth, which is 1 half. So then, oh, this might be, oh, this might be interesting. Um, so then our eigenvalues are going to be this plus or minus the square root of this squared minus 4 times that all over 2. So I get negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 4 minus 2, which is 2. And now since the square root of 2 is smaller than 2, this is always going to be negative. Right? You're going to get negative 2 plus square root of 2, which is still negative, and negative 2 minus square root of 2, which is still negative. So they're both negative, which means we have a stable node, aka a sink. And that's because both lambdas are less than zero. And with saddles, are those considered, how are those considered in stability? Saddles are, used, are considered unstable. And, the, and, and you, might make, you might say unstable with the caveat that if you start on a point that is on the eigenvector line, that is corresponding to the negative eigenvalue, then you will end up going towards your equilibrium, but any other starting point will push you away from it. So there is one path of stability for a saddle, but they're generally considered unstable. It's a good question. Um, so what we, what we would expect to see here with our, with our direction field is that all points will be pointing essentially in towards the origin or somewhat towards the origin. So if I was going to like, I mean, so I would expect right over here, like anything over here would be going that way. Um, yeah. But we're not being asked to do it. So let's see, we could draw those things. I don't really want to draw those things. Um, on, so just, just to kind of, just to clarify a bit here. Holy snakes. So on this blue Ivan line, sorry, no. On this blue null climb, we know that DC DT is equal to zero. And so that the horizontal part of the direction arrow or the arrow in the direction field, there wouldn't be a horizontal part, right? Everything on this would be purely vertical. And so what I would expect when we graph this is the arrows to be pointing down on the side. So for example, if I picked like, so right, this is the line P equal to C. If I pick P and C both equal to one, um, sorry, I'm, oof, oof, sorry, back up a second there, sorry, I got my colors mixed up, apologize. The blue one is actually for the second equation here, which means that the vertical part shouldn't exist and it should be purely horizontal, sorry about that. So this blue one here is corresponding to this one here. So along this line, my arrows should be totally horizontal. So I pick a point like 1, 1, which is on this line, if I plug in 1, 1 here, it's obviously going to be 0. If I plug in 1, 1 here, it's going to be negative 1 plus 1 half minus 1 half. So this part's actually going to be 0, so it's just going to be negative 1. So that means it's going purely right that way. And if I pick something bigger, like 2, 2, it's going to be negative 2, and these, are both, these, these will cancel again. So the arrows will be like kind of bigger. Or, I mean, they're all going to be horizontal. And then the same kind of thing they would show over here, but they're going to be going that way. And the reason I know they're going that way is because we have a stable sink, right? We know it's a stable node, so we know we have to be pointing in towards it. In the same sort of vein, if I pick something on this line, I know that it's going to be purely vertical. And it's going to have to be doing something like this. So that we're going in towards the origin. I do think, I do think it's worth. So now that we've done some of the graphing on our own, I do think it's worth looking at p-plane if that's okay. Please. Yeah. 
So for the ISIC, basic idea of no coins is that um, you set your you set your DC, DT, and DP, D, DT equal to zero, and then you basically find the lines. Correct. Yeah. Well, when, to do the curves. The curves. Sometimes the no lines are parabolas or other things. When the curves intersect, that's basically your equilibria. And to determine the directions for your null clines, do you just basically pick a point on the null cline? I do. And so, so, so that will actually, so I should say there's, there's kind of two different methods. One way is to pick a point on the null cline and say, okay, well, I'm just going to plug in the values to my differential equation and see what's happening. But I could also do the thing where I see what the signs are in this region over. So I could pick a point way over here, like five comma one. So if I pick C equal to five and P equal to one, I'm going to get, let's see, so this is going to be, so over here at you know, one, two, three, four, five, one. So way over here, if I plug in C equal to five and P equal to one, it's going to be negative five plus one half minus half halves. It's definitely going to be negative. So DC, DT is negative, meaning my arrow is definitely going to be going to the left. And if I plug that same point in here where C is 5 and P is negative 1, or P is 1, I get negative 1 half plus 5 halves, which is positive 2. So DP, DT is positive. So that means in there, my arrows are going left and up, like that. Um, I'm just looking at this here. At least I think they are. Well, now I see my. Sorry. Oh, that's because I'm. I didn't. I'm looking at the p-plane thing I've got here, and I haven't actually entered the new equation. So I'm like, whoa, this graph looks way different than what I was expecting because it's not the right graph. Um, and then we could do. And so then, so here's so here's the thing to remember about these isoclines or null clines. Whenever you cross a null cline, the null the null cline you're crossing, the sign of the thing that it corresponds to is going to change. So this null cline, this is where this null cline is where dp dt equals zero. So on this side of the null cline, dp dt is positive, right? Because that's the second thing. So on this side of the null cline, dp dt has to be negative. So up here it's going to be negative negative, meaning your arrows are going to go down to the left. And then the same thing is true about this null cline. If I cross this null cline, I have to change the sign of dc dt. So this is going to be positive negative in this region. This whole, I swear, this whole region over here, right? Positive negative. Right? These axes don't do anything really. And then when I cross this again, I'm changing the sign of dc dt, sorry, of dp dt. So it's going to be positive, positive. And if I cross this red one, I'm changing the side of the red one, which is the top one, to be negative and positive, which is the same here because right, these are really in the same region here. So looking at that, right, if I if I look at that, I can then kind of see that. Um, well, so I can actually. Um, what's wrong for here? Um, do that. Um, so that's another way of kind of seeing what's going on graphically. Right? So then right, when I go from here to here, I'm like, oh yeah, well, of course, right? My dp dt is going from positive to negative. So on that line, it's zero. Now, another thing you can do, and this is, I mean, this isn't really necessary here because you because you can just find the Jacob or the matrix, or there's the Jacobian because these are not partials. But you can totally do the graphical method where you say like, okay, well, if I'm crossing here and like I'm doing this, I'm asking what's changing, and you can find the signs of the Jacobian matrix or the matrix. But again, it's not, I don't think that's something we should do here because it's, it's a method we use in reserve when we're kind of left with other options. Other questions about this? Um, I do want to put it in the people and just kind of take a look and see. Let's 
So let's do this. Let's do that. Sorry, guys. One second. So let's turn my screen. So I see it there. So here's the graph I got when I threw it in the p-plane, or the direction field, not the graph. And we can totally see right exactly what I'm saying. So here's zero zero, right? And we can see that way over here, right, my arrows are going left and up. And then when I cross over this this isocline here, which which I guess I can't really graph the isocline. Yeah, so so but we can we can so we can't really graph the isocline, but we can identify it, right? I know that y equals x is an isocline. So if I look here, right, if I look at the line y equals x, if I trace that out, I can see, yeah, look, all the arrows on y equals x are totally just purely horizontal arrows. And that's an isocline. Similarly, y equals 3x. So if I start at 0, 0 and go over 1 and up 3, I can see that on that kind of line, so traveling this way, I can see that, oh yeah, all the arrows are totally just vertically pointing down, or if I go down to the left, they're vertically pointing up. Um, and then we can start clicking around, like, oh yeah, everything goes in, no surprise. Um, so yeah, so that's what you can see there. I mean, I don't think we needed to see this necessarily, right? We totally could have done this without this. It's still just nice to see. Um, okay, so we've classified these right now. You probably didn't even need the matrix to classify the equilibrium, right? You could probably look at this and see that, oh yeah, look, we have everything is pointing us, right? Even if we just look at the isoclines, everything is pointing us towards the origin. Right, there's nothing that's like pointing us away. Yeah. Whereas like if it was a saddle, it, it, would, it would be like more like a saddle if these vertical parts were turned around. So if these were pointing up and these were pointing down, then we'd kind of be going in, right in, but then we'd be going away. And that's more of a saddle behavior. Um, yeah. There was a second part of this question, which I'm not super confident about. It was the solve the initial value problem. So I guess my concern, although it might not really be a concern, for this particular problem in the textbook is I feel like it could be a typo, or maybe I, maybe not. They're saying the initial urea concentration in the in the in the thing, the initial concentration in the blood and the initial concentration in the pool are the same. I guess that might make sense. I don't know. I'm not gonna worry about it. So so oof. solve the initial value problem. I think that means we have to find the eigenvectors, right? Because we have to like write the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> also, for I think it was Julia that asked about the FN thing or whatever. If you know if that's in the book anywhere, like I know he posted a problem about it, but if there's a place in the book where that is, I would love to know where that is so that I can look there more quickly. Um, yeesh, all right. This looks terrible. So here's our matrix. Um, now I'm now I'm not super thrilled about these eigenvalues. Yeah, boy. But I suppose we should do this because it is terrible. But sometimes things are terrible. You know, like the world right now. No, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to go. Okay. So really, really this. Let me make sure my eigenvalues are correct. <laughs> Maybe maybe they're nicer than I thought they were. I don't really think that's true. Um, let's make sure my tau is definitely. Let's make sure I set this up right. Okay, no, that looks right. Tau is negative two. Delta is definitely three fourths, minus one fourth. Okay. 
Nope, that all looks sadly correct. So here's what we're going to do. That's the equation we have to solve, right? To find our eigenvectors. And I threw in the plus or minus just because I think we can probably do them both at once, but let's see. So using the first row, I've got negative three halves V1 plus one half V2 equals negative two plus or minus root two over two V1. Let's make our lives a little bit easier. Multiply everything by two. So negative three V1 plus V2 equals negative two plus or minus root two V1. Let's add three V1. So the negative two plus the three will give me a one plus or minus root two V1. So it's actually not that bad, I guess. I'm gonna pick V1 equal to one, and then V2 is gonna be one plus or minus root two. So my eigenvectors are, I'm sorry, I kind of chose I chose the names of and the pieces for my eigenvectors. I'm sorry. So my eigenvectors are one, one plus root two. And that's the, that goes with the eigenvalue. So this is the one that goes with the positive eigenvalue. So that's lambda equals negative two plus root two over two. And So those are the eigenvectors and their associated eigenvalues. They're not pretty, but sometimes they're not. We're not done. So now we can write our general solution. So I'm just going to write it here. So you know that our general solution to the equation makes what C comes first. C comes first. Alphabet, C before P. Okay. So C of T, P of T. It's going to equal C1 e to the lambda 1 T, V1 plus C2 e to the lambda 2 T, V2. So I'm going to do C1 e to the lambda 1. Times V1. Plus C2 e to the lambda 2 T V2. Okay. And then we're going to use our initial conditions to solve for C1 and C2. So I know what? C of zero is C naught. I erased it. I know that C of zero and P of zero are both C naught. So when I plug in T equal to zero, I get C naught, C naught equal to C one e to the zero. Let's just not even write that. I get C one times one. And I get C two times one times the eigenvector. Okay, so here's what we got. We got C naught equal to C1 plus C2. And we've got C naught equal to C1 times 1 plus root 2 plus C2 times 1 minus root 2. And then we can solve this system in some way. I guess, oh. <laughs> I guess solve for C1. Remember, so we want our answer to be in terms of C naught, right? Because C naught is the known value, initial value. So C1 equals C naught minus C2. Throw that in there. And then C naught equals C naught minus C2 times 1 plus root 2 plus C2 times 1 minus root 2. Multiply the sector out. Uh, let's see. C naught plus C naught root 2, 
minus root two, minus root two, root two, root two plus root two, minus root two. This is stupid. I'm trying to solve for C2, so bring all these things over here, cancel that, cancel that. And so I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring all the C2s over to the other side just because there's a lot of them. So, oh, these cancel too. Add this, add this. So I've got C2 root 2 plus another C2 root 2. I've got 2 C2 root 2 on the left equal to C0 root 2 on the right. So C2 is 1 half C0. And then C1 is the same. It feels like garbage. I could C1 is C0 minus C2, but C1 is just that. So C1 is also 1 half C0. That's a big old pain in the butt. Um, so yeah, you should definitely double check that work though, because I'm I'm fairly certain I did the right thing when I was finding which eigenvalue of which eigenvector. But you might want to be extra careful about that. So I mean, looking at those questions, four seems similar and also terrible. Six seems similar and also terrible. Um, I should say, so like, we know for this one, since both the eigenvalues are negative, that the long, so like, I'm looking at problem four here for a second. In problem four, they ask what in the long term, as t goes to infinity, what is the amount of pollutant in the crop? Well, I'm, I'm kind of applying that question here. In the long term, we see that the values of c and p both get closer and closer to zero because both of the eigenvalues are negative. Um, maybe we'll look at four. Uh, no, we won't have that day. Maybe on Friday we'll look at four because I definitely know that four is terrible. At least it looked like I was looking at whoever's posted their work, and their work looked mostly right, but it looked hard. Okay, so let's see. Um, I know Julie, you asked about this FN thing, right? Let me take a look here. And why am I not scrolling? Because there's nowhere to scroll. And the FN model. So I'm going to look at the homework because that's the only place I've seen that. So I'm looking at Rottenmacher's homework, problem three. I'm looking at the Fitzhugh Naguno model. Let's go ahead and see if there's maybe something about that in the textbook. EF. F for Fitz. QRST. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Lots of pages, 428, 475, 479, 666. So let's go there. Um, okay, recall the fits. Oh my gosh, okay. So I don't think, I don't think we don't need specific, I mean, so what I would like to do is maybe do an example that's not the one he's given, just because I try not to do the exact homework problems they do usually, but I might need to. Let's see. Let me look in the book here and see if there's like a question that might mimic this just a tiny bit. That looks weird. Sorry guys, one minute. Six seventy six. Let's go. Okay, I think. Of course. So there is one question in the textbook, and of course they give you terrible non-number numbers. They're just like here for these letters. All right, fine. We can work on this problem. I don't care. It's fine. So let's just try and figure out what they're even asking for. Because a lot of the time, these problems, it's just, it can be a challenge. I should also warn you guys, just in general, um, so we're about to kind of shift gears big time. Like, because we've been doing all this, like, differential equations, matrix stuff, and now we're going to do this probability stuff, which is, like, practically unrelated. So 
just be aware that the stuff we've been doing up until now is probably not going to be very related to the probability stuff we're about to do. I like probability stuff. I'm very comfortable talking about probability stuff because it, is, it makes a lot more sense to me than some of this differential equation stuff. But it will be a change of gear. So let's assume the following example of the FN model. All right, let's write it down. So you've got, and this looks to me, so just reading this, this looks to me like something where I might want to draw some null points. I don't know if that's right. So again, dv dt is negative v times v minus 0 0.0, sorry, 0 0.6 um, times v minus 1 minus w. And then we have dw dt is equal to 0 0.03 times v minus 0.6 w. Okay. And the first question, or the first so assume that w of zero is equal to zero, initial condition. And then for what initial values? Oh yeah, someone, I think someone had asked about this question. Oh, Eric, Eric had asked about this question on the discussion. And so, so I'll tell you what I did to answer the, to answer the question, but I don't imagine that's probably what you want us to do. So let's go. Ahead. So what I did was I went and put it in the P plane. And then I knew that so since I knew that w of zero was zero and w was my y variable, I looked at things that were on the line y equal to zero. And I asked myself, okay, I want to know where v of t is increasing, meaning I want to know where dv dt is positive, meaning I want to know where the arrows are pointing to the right, because that's where dv dt is positive. So I went and looked on the x-axis where are the arrows pointing to the right, and they were pointing to the right on the left side. So the left side arrows were pointing this way, and then at some point, either zero or one, or I'm not exactly sure where, they started pointing to the other direction, which means that dvdt was negative. So that's how I actually did this question. But obviously, on an exam, at least on a normal exam, you would not have p plane at your <laughs> disposal. So let's talk about how we should try and do this one. I mean, my, my intuition is, yeah, I want to draw the isoclines. Well, no funds. So and let's let's be smart about this. Let's let's actually write the different equations in different colors so I don't mess up which color is which. So let's say that dwt is equal to 0 0.03 um, times v minus 0.6. Let's and so hmm, yeah, darn. That w there is not so great, but it's fine. It's trash. Okay. I'm um, sorry. So here's my graph. Oh, that's not the pen I wanted. I'm out of good black pens. I think I have to go back to the office and rustle up some black pens. Maybe this will be okay for a minute. Uh, it'll do for the axes. Okay. There's our axes. One more. Oh, there's one. Okay. Anyway, you guys can see that already. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw the isoclines. And I'm going to start with the easy one. So again, for the isocline, so for the dwdt isocline, I'm just setting this equal to 0. I don't even need to pay attention to that, really. And if I can, I like to re-express things so that W or whatever the Y thing is, is isolated. Um, right? And we're thinking of V as the X thing and W as the Y thing. You can totally change it around and do it the other way, but it's pretty standard to do the first thing is X, the second thing is Y. Okay. So I'm just really thinking, okay, well, this has to be zero. So V minus... 0 0.6 w equals 0. So v equals 0.6 w, which I'm going to change to 3 fifths. And then solving for w, w is equal to 5 thirds v. So my isocline there is w equal to 5 thirds v, or y equal to 5 thirds x. Um, so let's try and graph this somewhat nicely. Yeah. 
So I'm gonna go over three, up five, sure. That seems a little extreme, James. There's one point on my DWGT ice claim. And so what I know on this ISO claim is that the vertical component is zero, so all of my arrows are pointing left or right. And I can even plug in a point, right? If I plug in three, five, I could say, well, three, well, I should be careful. We'll, we'll plug in, we'll see what happens. So if I plug in three for V and five for W, I actually have to do the math. I get negative three times 2.4 times two minus five. That's looking definitely negative to me, right? It's negative times positive times positive, which is negative, but it's also negative. So I know at this point over here, my arrows should be going to the left because dv dt is negative. Great. So now the, I wouldn't say harder part, just the part that's gonna seem harder at first. Um, can I erase this? Can I school with that? You can always rewind the video after I post it if you need to see it again, but it's literally, I mean, you got it. Okay, so I'm gonna do the same thing for the DVDT isoplane. So I'm going to set DVDT equal to zero. And while this might seem hard at first, it's actually super straightforward. So I've got, right, if I set this equal to zero, I'm just going to isolate W by adding it to both sides. And so setting this whole thing equal to zero, I'm going to add W and get W equal to all of this. So my DVDT isoplane is going to be W equal to negative V times V minus 0 0.6 times V minus 1, which is a cubic, but it's already factored for us. So we know where the x-intercepts are. So I've got an x-intercept at 0. I've got an x-intercept at 0 0.6. And I've got an x-intercept at 1. These are all kind of real close to each other. Um, and so I might plot a point over here. Well, I mean, I'm, so here's the thing. Let's use some pre-calculus knowledge. This is a third degree polynomial. And if I multiply that, the leading coefficient is negative. And it's a negative V cubed. So I know it's got this kind of shape where it's down on the right and up on the left. So I know whatever's happening, I'm doing something like this. And I know that each of these, since these are degree one factors, all of those x-intercepts were going to cross the axis. So it's looking like so cross at one, cross at 0.6, cross at zero. Something like that. Maybe not exactly. Um, right, if we plug in, uh, if we plug in negative one, for example, we have negative one times negative 1.6 times negative two, sorry, negative, negative one. So we'd have 3.2. So yeah, that seems, that seems fairly reasonable that a negative one I've got, yeah, my graph is all right. Okay, so how do we use this to answer the question about DVDT um, being positive? Well, <laughs> good question, James. Um, So I'm trying to figure out what's happening here. And what you could do, although this seems, no, this seems fine actually. What I guess I would probably do, just grab a different colored pen. I'd probably start over here. Let's start at negative one, zero. I know, we're almost, I know we're almost out of time, but just give me an extra minute or two. So if V is negative one and W is zero, so a V is negative one, I already know this part's 3.2, where I just plugged in negative one and got 3.2, so this minus zero. So negative one, zero, dV dt is, oh, that's interesting. Huh. Sure. So I'm going to the right because it's positive 3.2, and dW dt is 
0 0.03 times negative one minus 0 0.06. Interesting. So the reason I'm getting, oh, I know what it is. Okay. So I'm getting negative one point zero six times point zero three, which is about negative point zero three ish, right? It's not, right? Not so when I was looking at the key plane thing, it looked like it was purely horizontal to me. And the reason is because the vertical part is minuscule, right? It's 0 0.03 times some not big number. So what's actually happening here is it's going to the right and down very, very slightly, right? I mean, if I want to actually cap out, calculate that number, it's 0 0.03 times. Uh, sorry, that's negative one. This is zero. that's ne just negative one. Just negative point. It's just negative point zero three. Sorry, that's not even zero for w. So yeah, it's going like this, right? Just very, very slightly down and to the right. And now here's the thing that we're going to do. Yeah, we're going to be smart. So I only care about how the x direction changes. So when I cross this blue, so when I cross from here to here, right? When I go up in this region here, I'm going to cross this, which means the x direction arrows are going to change, right? So on this side, my arrows are going to be pointing down to the left. And then when I cross this red one, my y direction is going to change, and they're going to be, oh, go. gosh, things are a little bit tricky here. Yeah, so holy smokes. So I think we're to the left here because we've crossed the blue one. And I think when we cross here again, we're to the right. And then I think we're to the left. So, so I think what's happening here is, and I'm not worrying about the up or downness because we don't care, right? The question isn't about what DWDT is, the question is about what DVDT is. So it looks like my best guess is that DVDT is positive, right? Which, because that's what the question was asking, I think. Mm. Or, okay, yeah. So V of T is increasing, meaning DVDT is positive. Same thing, right? Right, right, right. So DVDT, blah, 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 words. <laughs> DVDT is positive, or V of T is increasing here. So all the way up from negative infinity to zero. And then not here, not here, but in this small little section from 0.6 to 1. I would definitely encourage you all to look at the graph on p-plane or whatever direction field tool you're seeing and see if you can see that little section in there. But yeah, that's, that's what it seems like is happening. It's a good question. Definitely, and it's definitely a good question to do graphical things with. Like I wouldn't want to try and, this is not a question I think you can really answer in any other way very well. So I think it's a good question. I think you guys should think about this one. I mean, I know we've answered most of it, but I still think it's worth thinking about. Um, if you wanted to, you could ask yourself the questions like, you know, I'm, I'll come up with something. I'll see you guys Friday. <laughs> good questions, you guys. Thank you. You're very welcome. Talk to you later.